Arthur Jr. is Director of Field Services uh, for the American Federal Government, uh, Federation of Government Employees. He's a leading labor, racial justice, and social justice activist. He's a writer, and he's worked impressively on a wide ranging set of uh, capacities to advance these causes. He's a senior scholar with the Institute for Policy Studies, has served as president of the Trans Africa Forum, a nonprofit group that works to improve foreign aid to African and Caribbean countries, and helped to establish the Black, Black Radical Congress, which espouses economic justice and human equality. In addition to his extensive array of involvements with pro labor groups, uh, Bill has written prolifically on labor and related subjects. His two most recent books, Solidarity Divided, which he co-authored with uh, Fernando uh, Capetian, and their bankrupt, uh, Bankrupting Us, deal specifically with the contemporary crisis of labor. They also, uh, we, and with the, the historical context given, uh, and it's given attention and rigorous analysis in the book. Through his writing and activism, he is highly regarded for his profound support of worker centers, which is fomented uh, as part of an effort to galvanize the labor movement and address issues that uh, unions cannot alone address. Modern labor activists owe a great deal of, uh, to this work of Bill Fletcher. Without his contributions, it is not at all certain that the progressive and integration labor movement would have emerged or quickly matured. With the vagaries of capitalism in mind, it is apparent that the advancement of workers when conceptualized narrowly and in isolation is doomed to failure. Only in establishing firm connections with larger goals of bringing about human, in, universal human dignity and quality has uh, Bill uh, as, as Bill has so firmly insisted, will the labor movement adapt to and survive the evolution of business, society, and work? Let us uh, welcome Bill Fletcher. taking a few minutes to listen to uh, my remarks. I want to thank uh, President Lipset and the uh, ALF for inviting me here. I also want to send a few shout outs. Uh, one to uh, the Secretary Treasurer of the New York State Fed, my friend Terry Melvin. Terry spoke at the uh, AFGE Legislative Conference, and um, I'm not going to comment so much on the conference because I need a job, but what I will say is that Terry lit up the house yeah. and, and had people on their feet in a way that was so remarkable and, and so incredible, so it set the stage. And we need much more of that. We need it from Terry, we need it from many other people. Um, I want to say hi to my friends from CSEA. Uh, and I did a, a bit of work with CSEA a few years ago. Uh, to the members and leaders of AFGE, uh, I want to express my appreciation that you're here and for your support. And I want to uh, thank uh, Franchelle Hart and the CPTU chapter for a wonderful uh, reception. <laughs> uh, and I want to say, Happy International Women's Day. <laughs> In 1970, there was a film uh, Pat, uh, starring George C. Scott, uh, a film that I would argue every labor leader and activist should see at least once. And in every leadership training, the first 20 minutes should be mandatory. I want to take you through the first, uh, some significant pieces of the first 20 minutes of the film. Uh, the film after, after George C. Scott is Pat and gives us remarkable speech, which as it turns out, was a speech that Patton gave uh, repeatedly during the war um, in, in different variations. 
you flash to the aftermath of the infamous Battle of Kasserine Pass, a battle in Tunisia where the US uh, II Corps encountered Rommel's Africa Corps and got its ass whipped decisively. And it's interesting, then you switch to Patton eventually coming to take over the two corps. And he, he, he took over the two corps because the two corps was a mess. It wasn't simply that they lost the battle, it's that they were a mess. Their strategy was wrong, their battle tactics were wrong, there was a lack of coordination with the British. It was absolutely horrible. And the general in charge of two corps was replaced, Patton comes in, and he doesn't simply replace his general, he reorganizes the two corps in its fundamentals. And the two corps then goes forward to defeat the Africa Corps in the next major battle that takes place. Uh, I start there because when we in the labor movement uh, encounter or uh, have battles, we seem to have a very different philosophy. The philosophy is sort of, you can keep losing, and you hold your job. You can keep losing, and you'll be elected again. You can keep losing, and we are bleeding to death, and people say, well, that's fine, because they've got to get a pension, we've got to make sure that they're taken care of. I say, the hell with that. We are losing. At what point do we start replacing generals? At what point do we start reorganizing the two corps? At what point do we say that the enemy has the advantage and that we have to do something different? Right? That's the question that confronts our movement. It is the question that we are so damn afraid to address. Because we're afraid. <laughs> we're afraid that in addressing it will piss somebody off. That's right. We'll get some, we'll hurt someone's feelings. Oh, they're doing the best that they can. Well, the general that was heading up the two corps was doing the best that he could, damn it. Right? He wasn't a coward. He just wasn't competent. That's right. When you're in a battle, you need competent leadership. That's right. It ain't personal. It's strictly business, as a certain outfit says. The, the labor movement has faced two strategic defeats over the last 65 years. <laughs> and a series of strategic miscalculations. And I, I don't want to talk some about this, and I realize I'm going to be stepping on toes. And as I said last night, the advantage I have is a 2.35 out of a flight. <laughs> <laughs> you with me? Yeah. <laughs> the two strategic defeats. 1948 Taft-Hartley. Our movement talks about Taft-Hartley, and we talk about it was bad. It wasn't bad, it was horrendous. And it's really important that we understand the depth of the defeat that we suffered in 1948 with the passage of, of Taft-Hartley. Because Taft-Hartley set into motion, it's, I, I like to refer to it as the curare dart that hit us. Curare is a slow-acting poison that slowly paralyzes you until it gets to your brain. In our case, it may have gotten to the brain first and then started to paralyze us. But in either case, that was the curare dart that hit us in 1948. It was a strategic defeat. It was a defeat of immense proportions because it basically said, in addition to setting up right to work states, it basically denied us the ability to carry out struggle. That's really what it did. It basically said, we're going to put your arms behind you and drop you in a shark tank and expect that you're gonna be able to swim and get to the other side. That's essentially what the Taft-Hartley did, <clears throat> did. And it was, in a boxing metaphor, the equivalent of going up against Muhammad Ali at his best and getting knocked in your face. That is what Taft-Hartley did to us. And we were stunned, stunned beyond belief. And we have been on the permanent defensive ever since. Don't, it wasn't simply that in 1955 we started to decline as a percentage of the workforce. We have been on the permanent defensive since 1948. Right? We have been that army that keeps retreating. 
each time saying it's not that bad, it's not that bad, but we keep retreating. The second strategic defeat, it's, it's a, a sort of slow moving strategic defeat from roughly 1975 to about 1985. And it was a, it's a defeat that was in connection with the reorganization of global capitalism and the ascension of something called neoliberalism. It was not just about what Reagan did in the PATCO uh, situation. PATCO was emblematic of an element of that defeat. It was a particular battle. But the strategic defeat was much longer. It was a defeat that was linked to the cons consistent concessions that unions made in the face of corporate uh, demands. Concessions that almost never preserved jobs, but continued to put us in a weaker and weaker position around the country. It was a period when we lost in the attempt at organizing uh, the Houston organizing campaign in 1980 to about 82, in that particular battle. So there was a strategic defeat that, again, we have been moving back slowly but surely, and at each point, trying to say it's not that bad, or some segments of our movement saying, well, it might be bad for the auto workers, but it's not bad for AFSCME. Mm -hmm. Or it may be bad for the steel workers, but it's not that bad for SEIU. It has been bad, it has been terrible. It has been horrendous for our movement as a whole. So these two significant strategic defeats that we've suffered, and rarely do we talk about them as strategic defeats. Let me just explain what I mean by that. When you suffer strategic defeat, you don't just simply lose a battle. It means that the enemy has flipped you, right? They have taken the wind out of your sails. They have disrupted your strategy. You are no longer moving forward. You're moving back. You can lose a battle. The two core lost the Kasserine Pass, but again, reoriented itself, came back and defeated the Africa Corps along with the British, right? You can, you can lose a battle. Losing a battle is not the main thing. It's when your strategy gets undermined. And you can't substitute it with a counter strategy, a counter offensive. That is when you're in deep trouble. Now in addition to two strategic defeats, we had a series of strategic miscalculations by the leadership of organized labor. One that was devastating was the Operation Dixie, 1946 to about 51 where the CIO allegedly was attempting to organize the South and it did a terrible job. It picked the wrong tactics. It had Northerners in charge uh, instead of having Southerners in charge. It wanted to avoid the issue of race entirely and it succumbed to anti-communism, right? So that some of the best organizers, the people that had helped build the movement in the 1930s were chased out and completely excluded from this effort. Uh, there was the um, Cold War miscalculation. The uh, Taft-Hartley Act, as you know, uh, had this thing called red causes that said that unions that had communists or alleged communists in leadership uh, needed to exclude those leaders or they would themselves lose the possibility of certification. And union after union turned on its leaders, turned on its members. You didn't have to be a proven communist. All that someone had to do was to allege you were a communist. And how do people allege that people were communists? Well, sometimes because they were militant. Sometimes because if they were white, they had black friends. Sometimes if they were black, because they were black. Um, it didn't particularly matter. And we turned in on ourselves. There's this, uh, this, uh, this image that I have from uh, Kurt Vonnegut's story, Slaughterhouse-Five, where there's this crazy guy that talks about how he got back at a dog once. And he, uh, this dog had bit him. He puts this coil from a mattress in this meat and gives it to the dog. The dog consumes the meat and then realizes something's inside of it and starts tearing at its stomach in order to get to the coil. That is what our movement did from about 1948 to 50. We tore at ourselves. We tore at our stomachs. We ate ourselves up in order to get to that coil, in order to prove to the political elite that we were loyal, to prove that we were anti-communist, to prove that we were patriotic. And as a result, we weakened our movement systematically. Civil rights movement. In the 1940s, black veterans returned from World War II, really fired up. They had gone to fight against fascism abroad, and they weren't going to accept fascism or racism at home. And they decided they had to come back and fight, and they helped to charge this movement that had been percolating from the 1930s on. 
This movement really starts to gain ground in the South, although it takes place nationally, as everybody knows. This movement is growing. And our movement, the union movement, had almost nothing to do with the civil rights movement. At the point when we're talking about organizing the South, there were no overtures except by left-led unions. No overtures except by left-led unions to the civil rights movement. The rest of the movement basically said, no, 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 we're just about organizing workers. As if workers, when they enter a plant, transform, go through some sort of twilight zone, and they cease to be black. They cease to be <laughs> They cease to they become right. workers, right? And those workers are only concerned about wages and hours and working conditions. They're not concerned about lynching. They're not concerned about racial discrimination, That's right. Right? That's right? That the union movement could ignore this. And it did this at, at, at its disservice. So that while in the 1940s, there's this emerging movement that's gaining power, the civil rights movement that then starts spreading to other movements. And you start to see this emerging uh, process among Chicanos in the Southwest and among Puerto Ricans and then among women, et cetera, et cetera. As this is gaining ground, your movement was taking a pass. That's not our job. Our job is to look out for our workers, just like a good insurance company should always do. Then we had the Vietnam War. And, and it's, it's to the credit of George Meany, and I never give George Meany any credit, but it's to the credit of George Meany. It reminds me, and I know this is going to piss off some people, but George Meany, at the end of his life, said he had been wrong about the Vietnam War. And I credit him that. I credit him that in the same way I credit the slave owners who right before they died basically said, you know, I was wrong to have these people in slavery for so long, right? That's the level of credit I'll give. It is good that he finally acknowledged it, but all during the 1960s and early 70s, he oversaw a movement that attacked, that demonized those of us that said, this war is criminal, this war is aggression, we have countless numbers of US troops, young men and women over there dying for nothing, not to mention the two million Vietnamese that died. Meany was part of that. He will have to pay for that in eternity, right? Our movement was on the wrong side, and very few of us are willing to say, you know what? We were, and, and let me tell you one of the reasons why. Because see, in the United States, we got this funny idea about history. It's, it's what I call from now on. Yeah. And, and, and the way it works is sort of like this. I may have killed your family, but from now on, I guarantee I will not do it again. I may have stolen your land, but from now on, I will not steal any more of your land. We, we don't take account, we don't, we don't stop and say, wow, we really screwed up, and what can we learn? Because see, it's not about morality. Right? I couldn't give a damn about that. It's about what do you learn from the errors that you make. When you allowed yourself to get into a criminal war like Vietnam, what lessons do we learn? Or do we get into another criminal war like Iraq? Right? Do we just allow this to continue? At one point do we stop and we say, what are the lessons that, that we must learn? So there were the strategic miscalculations. Um, we fail as a movement to really engage in strategic organizing. Organizing in the movement as a whole continued up until the early 1980s, but it lacked any real strategy. It was more this, you know, hot organizing, hot plan organizing, and, and rather than trying to figure out how do we really crack the new industries? How do we get back into the South and crack the South? How do we get into the Southwest? So we, we messed, uh, messed up there. We have really never figured out what to do about electoral work. We mobilize, we mobilize, and we get into this thing that reminds me of Charlie Brown, right? You know Charlie Brown and Lucy, you know that cartoon where Charlie Brown is holding the football and Lucy comes and kicks Charlie Brown, right? And, and each time she apologizes to Charlie Brown and he accepts the apology. It's like, I feel like that's our movement, right? We get in electoral politics, we put all these resources into some of these politicians, we don't get a damn thing, we get kicked in our ass afterwards, and then next election time, they apologize to us. I'll be better. Yeah. At what 
point do we start elevating our own members to run on a workers' platform? A platform that really represents working people. I'm not just talking about representing the interests of SEIU, or the UAW, or the painters, or IBW. I'm talking about workers. I'm talking about the workers that go beyond being union members. At what point do we start elevating and running our people? At what point do we start saying, we have a worker's vision for Buffalo? We're not just going with somebody else's vision. We have a worker's vision. We have an idea as to how Buffalo can turn around and become a place that working people want to live in, thrive in, feel is in their home, not simply that they're paying rent to somebody uh, somebody else. At what point do we engage in electoral politics along those lines? And then finally, we abandoned ec economic justice. Yep. We right. did. I mean, let's be real. Right. I mean, one of the things that happened in the 1950s is that we inherited a movement that basically said our job is to look out for the members. Well, okay, when you're about 35% of the workforce, I can understand it, it's still wrong, I can understand it though, because you're talking about one out of three. But as you shrink, what does that mean? What does it mean? See, one of the things that's really interesting about our movement, which is why I have not taken the Kool-Aid and why I am optimistic, <laughs> right, is that when we speak up and fight on behalf of workers, that's right. That's right. we win. That's right. We win. The, the, the Teamsters strike in 1957, uh, 1997 against UPS. I use that always as an example, along with the Chicago teachers strike. The, the, what struck, was striking about the Teamsters strike against UPS was that UPS knew they were going to kick the ass of the Teamsters. They knew it. They knew they were going to paint the Teamsters as bloated, as inefficient, as corrupt. <clears throat> the Teamsters turned that entire fight into a battle for full-time work. <laughs> and workers around the United States rallied to them. Right. Opinion poll after opinion poll said the Teamsters are fighting for us even though these workers weren't even in the Teamsters. Right. The Teamsters are fighting for us. The same thing happened in Chicago in the teachers' strike. Rahm Emanuel knew he was going to kick the ass of the Chicago Teachers Union. He knew he was going to paint them as nothing more than a special interest. Instead, they flipped the script. They turned that struggle into a fight for the kids, and they never lost the support of the parents. We can actually do it. When we are the vanguard in the fight for economic <coughs> justice, when we are not acting like a trade association, but instead acting as a movement, the people rally to us. When we act as a lobby, people say the hell with you. A good example of that is the 1987 football strike. 1987 football strike was horrendous, thank you very much. Gene Upshaw just led it into disaster, right? In 1987, they were fighting over free agency. Who the hell knew what free agency was? Most people had forgotten about the fight of Kurt Flood. They had forgotten about what the uh, baseball players had done in the 1970s. They didn't get it. And the, the, uh, the, uh, the Football Players Association didn't give a damn about going in and talking with the public about why this was of any importance. Contrast that with the lockout, the NFL lockout just a couple of years ago, where under a very different leadership, there was active outreach to explain to people that this was not a battle of the millionaires against the billionaires. This was a battle that regular people needed to uh, to engage in and to support, and a completely different response from the public. See, the bottom line is, we can do it. We don't have to die. We do not have to be the incredible shrinking movement. We actually can flip the script, right? But it means something very, very different, which is what I want to turn to. In the 1990s, there were many efforts at reform in our movement that started to emerge. Because people, you know, leaders weren't stupid. I mean, people could look at the charts and tell we were the incredible shrinking movement. They could tell that the numbers were, were, were dropping. Uh, they knew that we had suffered defeats. But what happens in the 90s? Well, it, it's, it's sort of interesting. The, uh, there was a, a lot of attention that we paid, you know, those of us that were trying to help to, to reform things, to something that was called political will. 
term became very, very popular. And people were talking about how you know, leaders didn't have sufficient political will to make the changes that were necessary. And what I, what I finally realized is that it's not about political will. See, it's something like this. If you believe that the world is flat, you're not gonna sail very far out to sea. See, it's not about stupidity. It's not about lack of courage. It's really about worldview. It's about how you look at the situation and how you look at the alternatives that are out there. What we missed in the 1990s were the obstacles to political will. What were the obstacles that were holding back leaders from making the kind of changes that, uh, that, they, that they needed to make? And I would suggest to you that a lot of it comes down to real differences on what is the essence of trade unionism. You know, there's this quote that A. Philip Randolph used um, or, or, or uttered, and I've used it repeatedly because I think it's so brilliant. Uh, and, and I just want to read it for a second. He said, the essence of trade unionism is social uplift. The labor movement has been the haven for the dispossessed, the despised, the neglected, the downtrodden, the poor. I think it's a brilliant quote. There's only one problem. It's not true. When you're looking at the US trade union movement, I want you in your honest moment to stop and think about the words I just read and ask yourself the question, does that characterize our movement? And I think that the honest answer is no. We are in a movement that is more concerned about being called middle class than working class. We're in a movement that frequently wants to distance itself from the poor. That, that, that does not see the poor, whether it's the working poor, the unemployed, as being part of our natural constituency. See, what, what Randolph was saying is, in my opinion, absolutely correct in terms of what we should be. The essence of trade unionism should, in fact, be social uplift, but if it's going to be social uplift, it's more than just about protecting our existing members. Right. It's right. more than about turning our organizations into fraternities and sororities. It's a completely different view of how we need to operate and actually who we are as well as who we're up against. So if you believe that the world is flat, you will not sail out to sea. If you think that the union movement is an association <clears throat> that protects its own, supports uncritically US foreign policy, promotes competition between employers, and simply is aimed at getting a better deal, how can you think about the dispossessed? How can you ever think about the despised, the neglected, the downtrodden, and the poor? So this was the problem that we encountered in the 1990s and early 2000s when local leaders and national leaders were appealed to, almost begged, to engage and change processes. But you see, to sail out beyond the land, the view of land, brings with it so many unknowns. There might be sea monsters. You might drop off the edge of the world. You see, for too many leaders, sailing out to sea, and in our case, what that means is engaging in real union transformation, brought with it, or brings with it, an equal number of unknowns. For example, workforces that we don't necessarily know or understand, forms of organization like worker centers with which we're unfamiliar, disruptions with the political elite, thereby compromising our alleged res respectability. What I mean by that last part is that we are in a movement that grew up raising hell. We're in a movement that right now is actually more concerned about respectability than raising hell. Right. We're in a movement that is more concerned about can our leaders have coffee and tea with Obama, That's right. yep. with this congressperson, That's right. with this state senator, or whatever, than raising hell. There's a story I said last night uh, at the reception, and I'm going to repeat this. In, 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 in spring 2009, when the healthcare debate was unfolding, 
There was uh, there were a segment of uh, the union movement with which I identified that was fighting the single payer. I still think we need single payer. So um, the segment of the movement was raising hell, saying we need single payer. So word apparently came down from the White House to the labor movement saying, uh, you know, if you all don't shut up and, and tone this all down, you're going to be excluded from, you know, future meetings. And at that point, many of our leaders shut up. Right? Now, as I said last night, unfortunately, no one called me and said, Fletcher, what should we do? <laughs> I'm not quite sure why, but um, they, they didn't call. So, uh, but, but I'll tell you what I would have said. I would have said something like this. And, and see, if this, if this was not a form of meeting, I wasn't being taped, I'll tell you what I really would say. But it goes something like this. I would have told the White House where to go, at what rate of speed, and what to do when they got there. I would have told them the future. meetings, I don't need to be there. Right. But if you think those meetings are going to last very long if I'm outside yelling, you got uh -huh. a, little, a little thing coming. Right? I would have told them that my job is not to be your agent. My job is to represent workers. Right. Right? My job is not to make you comfortable. My job is to make you uncomfortable. That's, right. That's my job. It's nothing personal. Right. It's not about whether I like Obama or not. My job is to represent workers, to fight for workers, right? To make sure that the interest of workers is advanced, not to apologize for the White House, for anyone in Congress, governors, or whatever. That's not my job. That's someone else's job. And they get paid a lot for that. That ain't my job, right? And this, is, this was something that, that, that was missing. Um, so what do we conclude from all this? Well, one thing that I think we have to conclude, and this is probably one of the most difficult things for us, is that the old trade unionism is dead. But as with the Bruce Willis character in the film The Sixth Sense, we seem to be unaware of that fact. Um, I just want to give you a second, just a second to think about that for a minute. Um, we are therefore either in the process of being buried or like the phoenix bird, rising from our own ashes. Now, if we are a phoenix movement, or perhaps at a phoenix moment, we need to undertake a renewal, a real renewal. It's going to be hard, but it needs to include a few of these things. The following. One is we have to understand the nature of the system that we operate under. Uh, Capitalism is a very, very vicious, amoral system. It is the first actual amoral economic system this planet has had, amoral. Now you can decide whether you think it's immoral, but it is amoral, that is, it is the absence of morals. The objective of capitalism is the accumulation of profits, again, removing anything in the way, right? They literally do take the notion, it's nothing personal, it's strictly business. Right? And, and so we are in that system. This is not a system of playing patty cake. This is not a system where there's any kind of permanent compromise, any kind of permanent arrangement between workers and capitalists. The capitalists are always intent on destroying the power of workers. That is their job, right? They're always intent on destroying the organization of workers. That is their mission. It is not personal. It is what comes with the very nature of the system. And we should start talking with our members about that instead of playing these games. It's not just about who happens to be the head of a corporation. It's not just about who happens to be the president of the United States. It's about the system. The system sucks. The system crushes people. The, the system drives the, the desire out of people. It turns us into robots, right? That is the nature of the system. We should talk with our members about that. And when we do, 
One of the things that we will find is that our members are going to appreciate it because our members are trying to figure out day in and day out why are their lives getting worse? What is it about what they themselves are doing or not doing? Are they not working hard enough? Should they be working three jobs instead of two? Should everybody in the family be working? Should they take the kids out of school? Should they sell their homes and go somewhere else? If they're not balancing their checkbook, no, it's a system. The system that is destroying workers in this country. And why is it not our movement? Why is it not our movement? That damn it speaks up and says that to workers rather than playing some sort of game of patty cake. Right. Yeah. yeah. Second thing you gotta realize, we're in a situation of what's called asymmetrical warfare. That means that the other side really has all the guns and the tanks and the airplanes, right? That's what it means. It means that you can't fight the other side using the same methods, material that they have because you don't have it. But it doesn't mean you surrender. Right. It means that you change your strategy. It means you change your forms of organization. It means you change your tactics. It means that you figure out who are your allies out there. Who else has an interest against this elite? Who else can join with us? and move forward. It's asymmetrical warfare. You know, every election season, when we think that all we have to do is raise more and more money and more and more money, hey, listen, I hate to break it to you. We're never gonna have the money the Koch brothers. It ain't gonna happen. And I'm tired of hearing union people cry all the time about, oh my God, we don't have enough money. No. Will Robinson, danger, right? It's not about that. It, we're not gonna have that money. We never will. We never will. But we got the people. We have the people. They are out there. Some are in our ranks. Many more are not. They are out there. They're looking for leadership. They're looking for organization. We can take down the Koch brothers. As long as we fixate on we've got to have the money, we've got to have the money, we've got to have the money, we'll lose. When we start figuring how we going to jack these guys up, what, what are their weak points, right? Where can we do something? How can we destabilize them? Which I'll get to in, in a second. Um, we need to learn, as I said, from Chicago and from the NFL lockout that we actually can win. We can turn this entire situation around. We also have to understand that labor must be a movement for global justice and not just US justice. I, mean, I was thinking about something when a uh, speaker earlier was talking about how, uh, I think it was Niagara, he was talking about it's becoming like the third world. Well, there's a question you have that, that, that begs. How did the third world become the third world? And, and actually, what were we doing while the third world was becoming the third world? In, in, in other words, when countries like El Salvador were being destroyed by a civil war, which the United States was, was pushing, Right? What were we doing? Right? Literally. I mean, I want you to think about it for a second. What were we doing? What were we standing up and saying, no, 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 you can't do that. Right? What were we doing when somewhere between 250,000 and 500,000 Guatemalans were being destroyed in, in, in a historic race war that was backed by the United States? What were we doing? And see, here's the problem, and I know this, this hurts, and I know some people are gonna be upset, but you know, people will say, Bill, but I didn't know. And it reminds me of the story I heard about this German, uh, young German woman, late 1940s, who um, was talking to her elders about the concentration camps and the extermination of Jews. And she said to them, well, why didn't you do something? And they said, we didn't know. And she said, you knew as much as you wanted to know. You knew as much as you wanted to know. It's very comfortable not knowing certain things. It's very comfortable knowing or not knowing that 500,000 Mayans in Guatemala are being wiped out with your tax dollars. It's very, it's, it is, it is. It's very, very comfortable not knowing that the US was helping uh, turn Angola into the country, the second country in the world with the most landmines on its planet. It's very comfortable. See, one of the things that's happened is that what has been going on to the third world is now coming home to us. 
And the problem is that the resolution of that situation is not going to be a resolution that's only here, but it's going to necessitate a relationship that we have with workers around the world, unlike any that we've had in the past. We're going to need new forms of organization, long-term commitment. The, uh, the UAW, or the workers' loss in Chattanooga at the Tennessee plant, where the workers uh, unfortunately lost the ability to join the United Auto Workers, uh, my hope is that the UAW will not turn away, but will say it was Kasserine Pass. And now we're just waiting for one more chance to kick the ass of the Africa Corps, right? That you don't turn away after you lose a battle. You learn the lessons. And see, one of the things that we need to learn about Chattanooga is that the right wing took our playbook. They did the community organizing we should have been doing. They took the billboards. They created a message. And they played on weaknesses in the UAW. Right? And so the fact that, uh, that uh, VW did not oppose unionization, that was good. But the reality was, if you're organizing in this political climate, that we have to deal with the reality that the, these forces that are out there are going to do anything that they can to, to disrupt our efforts, to turn workers against us. They learned from our playbook. We seem to have left the playbook at home. Um, we have to, uh, 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 two more things. We have to look at the issue of power and not just the issue of influence. See, our movement is good at influence. We don't really want to think about power. Because see, if we're going to think about power, then we have to start thinking about strategic allies. We have to really think, we're going to be taking over. Who else are we working with? Who are the other forces that are out there? See, we're great at lobbying. I'm suggesting that if we want to really win, we got to fight for power. Now, the, the this, this thing I wanted to raise, <clears throat> I was encouraged yesterday to raise this, is to give you an example of when I talked before about asymmetrical warfare um, and, and what I call creative mischief. See, we, it, it sort of reminds me of in the, in the American Revolution, the British got really upset because the colonials wouldn't fight conventional warfare. You know, they, like the British wanted the, co the colonials to walk out there with their nice blue uniforms, stand up in the middle of a, you know, a, a field and fire at each other, right? And the colonials said, why should we do that? We don't want to die, right? And, and we're going to take out the, 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 the British whichever way we can. So if that means hiding behind the trees, that's what we're going to do. All right. We have to engage in, in really new thinking. And, uh, and so let me use this uh, historical metaphor and then um, make the point. So in 1942, early 1942, the US was losing World War II. Uh, the fleet had been destroyed in Pearl Harbor. Uh, the Philippines was soon to be collapsing. Island after island in the Pacific was uh, falling. And in the Atlantic, the U-boats were just running wild, destroying everything. And Hitler was approaching Stalingrad. Um, so there was no reason to be optimistic. In that moment, what Franklin Roosevelt and his top people did was came up with this brilliant notion. And it later came to be known as Doolittle's Raid on Tokyo. And it was, it was turned into a film called 30 Seconds in to Over Tokyo. Now, what's important to understand about this is that this raid was unprecedented. It had ne nothing like this had ever happened. B-25 bombers launched from three aircraft carriers and hit five Japanese cities. But here's what uh, is also important to no. know. Contrary to the movie 30 Seconds Over Tokyo and the miss, very minimal damage. Very minimal damage to the Japanese, at least militarily. But it did something. The Japanese freaked. Because you see, at that point, in April 1942, Japan was supposed to be impervious to any kind of US attack. So all of a sudden, these B-25s come over, and they start dropping their bombs on Tokyo, Yokohama, and Kyoto, and two other cities. And the Japanese freaked. And at that point, they did something they should never have done. Go after Midway. Instead of proceeding further south and taking out Australia, which they probably could have done, they decided, we're going after the Americans. We're going to Midway. And what they didn't realize is that the American forces had un uh, broken the Japanese codes. It was a trap. 
The Japanese fleet moved on Midway and they got their asses whipped. And Admiral Yamamoto, brilliant strategist behind Japanese uh, naval strategy, was killed in the process. From Midway on, the Japanese did not advance. It was a perpetual retreat, just like we've been doing. Right? That's called creative mischief. The US provoked the Japanese into doing something they should never have done. Now, in our situation, the right wing does it to us all the time. They do these ballot initiatives. They'll go to California, as I was saying last night. And they'll go to California, they'll do a ballot initiative that will say, we're going to divide California in half, and all the white people are going to move north. And all, at that point, everyone freaks out, right? And then they start, start pouring money. Everybody's pouring money into California to stop the ballot initiative. And the right wing is laughing. They are hysterical. They know the ballot initiative isn't going to pass. They're doing it in order to disrupt our strategy to get us to put resources in, as well as for them to build base areas. Now, why aren't we doing this? Last night, I suggested, why aren't we going into the South? Why aren't we going into any, any state in the South where there's ballot initiatives? Or maybe, it doesn't have to be ballot initiatives, because there's no state initiative. And why are we moving a rights at work constitutional amendment in each state? Rights at work, not rights to work. Why don't we move a, 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 a constitutional amendment that gives every worker just cause before they're terminated? Every, every workplace, a mandatory health and safety committee, right? Every workplace, uh, sick time, right? Could you imagine what the Koch brothers and Heritage Foundation and others would do? They would totally freak. And they would inevitably do something they shouldn't do. And that's when you say, gotcha, right? But see, we don't want to think like that. But see, that's what asymmetrical warfare is about. It's seizing, taking advantage of your own strengths and flipping the script on the other side. Understanding their weaknesses and moving against them. So let me start moving towards wrapping up because I've been probably talking too long. Oh, let, me, let, me, let me say that, um, you know, when you're, when you're crossing the sea, I said to them, you know, before Columbus crossed over here, began what I refer to as the invasion, uh, there were Europeans and Africans who had come to the Americas. Yeah, I mean, the Vikings had been here. There's clear evidence that Africans got to Central America. Uh, it looks like the Japanese and Chinese probably got to uh, the Pacific Coast. And for all we know, Native Americans may have gotten to the Polynesian areas and to Africa. Now, irrespective of your historical conclusion about Christopher Columbus, his journey and the news that spread shattered the old paradigm. In our movement, there have been many examples of Phoenix efforts, but they have not shattered the paradigm that we're operating in. The time has come for us to reject the old myths and fears. More than anything else, our fears have served to immobilize us and lead some people to believe that a slow death with limited pain is far better than seizing the possibilities of victory. Of, of course, the situation is bleak and the odds are against us, but tell me one circumstance when that was not the case for working people. Therefore, let us set sail, knowing that we have no other choice, sailing towards what Shakespeare referred to as the undiscovered country, the future. Sailing into a gale, facing constant threats to our existence, but also realizing that our alternative is not only, and not mainly defeat, but rather the eternal humiliation that is the essence of the capitalist power over working people. Thank you very much.
take about uh, 10 minutes worth of uh, questions, and then we'll get back to the agenda. So a couple, three questions will be just perfect if we have any. Yeah. We have, uh, all right, hang on. We got microphones if we need them, but Bob, you're up. Would you like to? Bill, could you elaborate on how do we encourage the more younger workers to get involved in the movement? Okay. Why don't we take hold? Yeah, uh, anybody else? Brother Oko, Sean, yeah. How do we get a hold of you? Uh, uh, the college, the college. I'm, just, uh, I'm interested in, uh, in, in, in your thoughts on fast food forward in the fight for 15 right now. There's two. Got one more? All right, Danny, yep. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I first I want to thank you and others that have decided to invite uh, Bill Fletcher here. As of today, I didn't know who he was other than reading about it in WNY Labor Today. But thank you so much. A very, very spirited, educated person. Many more like him that the organized labor movement needs today. Many more. take a couple questions, but uh, we will end this program by noon, uh, and you, you don't have to, you go. and he'll be hanging around. There are books in the hallway if you'd like to buy one, they're here, um, so let's do it there. So we'll take these couple questions and then we'll go on with the rest of the program. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, that last comment, and uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to tell my wife what you said. <laughs> um, in terms of encouraging young workers, so we, we, have, a, we have a real problem here uh, because what's happened in our movement is that we do things that discourage young workers from getting involved. And, uh, and, and we keep doing that and it doesn't help that we're shrinking so that opportunities are not there the way they were. But even if they weren't, there's, there's a pattern and the pattern is basically this notion that sort of you have to pay your dues before I'll even listen to you. And, and it's not recognizing that among younger workers, there are different ways of doing things. There are networks that we should be tapping into. And, and as I was saying at the, uh, at the reception last night, there is a tremendous way of discouraging young workers from ever getting involved. And it's by uttering the following words. This is not the way we do it here. Yeah. Right? Now, all, that's all you have to do. All you have to do is just, just use those words, and, and you'll be free of the burden of young people. Whoa. <laughs> right? And, and, uh, and it is absolutely insulting. See, it's not that younger folks don't need to learn things, and it's not that we're encouraging people to do anything stupid, but it's that we need to be able to listen to younger workers and hear what they're saying, and that they might be introducing different ways of things. I may not, you know, people tell me all the time, I've got to be doing tweeting, you know, and, and every time I hear that, I think of Tweety Bird and everything, I just, <laughs> I'm sorry, I do. But everyone says, you got to tweet, right? Well, the reality is that I'll probably never tweet as much as someone who's in their 20s. That's right. And I'm not going to try to act like I'm in my 20s. Okay. But if someone is saying that to me, and they're saying it repeatedly, I need to listen. What are they trying to get across? Well, part of what they're saying is that they think that there's something I'm saying that's of some value, and that it needs to get into a very different network than I'm used to getting to, right? So you've gotta be able to listen. And uh, the other thing that is that we've gotta have creative space for younger people to be leaders. Um, that might be, you know, the committees that are set up, uh, uh, that are targeted young workers. And, and by young, we should understand that young is not actually a biological term. Right. It's, it's actually, it's, 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 a, it's a political term that's based on certain periods of time. But let me explain what I mean. I became active when I was 15 in high school. Uh, and the leaders of our movement of the, the, the social movements at that time were really old. They were like in their late 20s, <laughs> 30, 
I mean, just absolutely archaic, you know? And I never wanted, if you had said, Bill Fletcher, you're gonna go into the young workers, I would have slapped you. Like, I'm not young. So I'm saying, so, so we've gotta be careful. We, what we've gotta understand is that at a minimum, people under 30 have a different life, a different life experience. And, and so we've gotta be paying attention to that. Um, so it's an intergenerational alliance. In terms of Fight for 15 and the fast food work, organizing, I think that this is, along with the working to organize Walmart, are two of the most important things that the movement is doing, but there are some real challenges that are out there. When we're talking about organizing fast food, even though there have been some demographic changes that have taken place, there remains high turnover. Second, it is very unlikely that in any of these places will ever get a contract. Right. And if you do, it won't last more than a few years because right. the workforce will change. But the organizing in, in fast food really could be part of municipal movements right. that actually set stages right. uh, 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 and, uh, and basically say that, you know, if you're in fast food, you're going to be paying X. If you're in fast food, you will have these kind of benefits. The retail industry needs to do the same thing. We need to have in retail that kind of movement because it, it's gonna be hard to organize every individual Gap store, for example, right? But we can develop citywide requirements when we build the right kind of movement. And so I think that the, the efforts around fast food and, fat, and the fight for 15 is absolutely the way uh, that we need to go. Now, I'll, I'll go one step further. One thing that we are not doing we have completely, as a movement, fallen down on is organizing the unemployed. And, and let me just say, as, as someone who's a historian, that there's two segments of the population you never want to ignore. Veterans and the unemployed. And the reason for that is it's not, about, it's not a moral thing, although you can have a moral view on it. It's political. If, if progressives are not organizing unemployed and veterans, the right wing is. Ask the people of Germany or Italy, right? And, and, that, and so we need to be, A, the movement needs to be doing a lot more organizing among veterans, a lot more organizing, particularly people coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan who are really pissed off, right? They went into wars in, uh, that we were lied into Iraq. Uh, they went into wars where the purposes were completely unclear. They come back into the Great Recession with no promise of the future. They are there for the pickings by the right wing, right? So we need, as a union movement, to be organizing veterans. But we also need to be organizing the unemployed. And, there's, and there are different segments of the unemployed. There's a structure of the unemployed, people that have been out of work for long periods of time, and then there are the cyclical groups. And then sometime, somewhere in between, you have these new groups that had never experienced unemployment at all, particularly white collar, that all of a sudden, particularly around 2007, 2008, found themselves out of work and had no idea what to do and blamed themselves and had focused inwardly. Our movement is doing nothing. And I've, I've, I've pleaded with the AFL-CIO. We've got to develop an unemployed organizing project. And the kind of response I get is, well, Bill, you know, that's a nice idea, but none of the affiliates are really invested in it. Well, I don't expect an affiliate to be invested in it. I do expect, however, a federation that is supposed to represent workers to be concerned about that. And that means that, for example, you all, if you agree with me, should be raising some hell with your affiliates, with the ALF, and with the National AFL-CIO, and saying, we've got to do something because there's this reserve of unemployed workers out there that I remain convinced can actually be mobilized to do the right thing.